Great. Uh, welcome to the session on uh, supply chains and inflation. Um, just as a reminder, uh, pr presenters get 30 minutes uh, and discussants get 10 minutes. And the first paper is by Peter Tillman. Take it away. All right. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. From my side, uh, let me thank the organizers for being here. It's a great honor to present this ongoing work. And this is joint work with uh, David and Matthias. David is at the Bundesbank and Matthias is at the Riksbank. And what we do in this project is we look at the consequences of disruptions of global supply chains. We have seen quite a few of them over the past couple of years on price setting. And here we use a data set from Sweden because they allow us to use microdata so we can look at the price setting of individual firms on the product level for Sweden. So I don't have to uh, to, to, to explain a lot about the relevance of supply chains, obviously, over the past couple of decades, we've seen globalization, trade integration, and that went hand in hand uh, with an increasing integration of global supply chains. And usually supply chains are, of course, a source of efficiency and, 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 and growth and, and so on and so forth. But the problem is over supply chains, firms get exposed to shocks that occur somewhere else in the world. And, and um, we have seen these types of shocks earlier um, in, in, in this decade and also before, think of natural disasters, think of uh, the pandemic, think of geopolitics uh, these days, they all have highlighted that uh, there's quite a level of vulnerability of global supply chains. And, um, and that's why supply chain bottlenecks are considered to be one of the major drivers of inflation, at least since uh, over the recent surge of inflation since um, 2021. Now, what we do in this paper, we estimate the effects of supply chain disruptions on price setting using data as a set of um, Swedish firms. Now, this is the type of, speaking of Sweden, this is the type of newspaper reports we had in mind when, when, when starting this project. Uh, and you have seen quite a few of these, um, of these uh, types of news over the past couple of years. Now, here's how we proceed in uh, in four steps. First thing we do is we um, estimate a VAR model, so on aggregate data. The purpose of this is to derive a series of structural supply chain shocks. So this is based on macro data. Then we combine micro data on the product level, or with, it's essentially the data that underlies the Swedish producer price index. We combine it with information about firms from administrative firm level um, information and uh, we identify and then we ask ourselves well how does this global supply chain shock feed into the price setting at the product level um, of firms and uh, as as a treatment effect if you want uh, we interact the firm um, with uh, the, the firm specific um, export intensity, so the share of exports over production with this global supply chain shock, and then ask, well, how do firms respond to these shocks? And in the next step, in the fourth step, we distinguish between firms along several dimensions, such as small firms versus large firms, high export intensity, low export intensity, different types of inventory holdings, and ask, what makes firms particularly prone to uh, these types of supply chain disruptions? Now here's what we find. Well, we find that global supply chain shocks of the of the type that we look at here uh, have strong and significant effects, and firms strongly increase uh, their prices following this shock. We find that roughly um, a one percentage point higher price after a one standard deviation um, global supply chain disruption, and this is relatively persistent. And importantly, we find that there's quite a degree of heterogeneity across firms. So uh, firms respond differently to this type of uh, adjustment, as we think, in a, in a very meaningful way. So I don't want to talk a lot about the literature. Several people who contributed to this are, are also in the room. There's, well, there has been, over the past couple of years, an explosion in the interest of supply chains and also the macro. There was always the literature on, the, on using micro data on supply chains, but, but given that we had this surge in inflation, and inflation and supply chains as a, as a potential driver of that. There's also more evidence from the macro side uh, on, on supply chains over the past couple of, of, of years. All right, 
So let me speak first about the make microdata. Then I have to move to the macro side and then come back to the micro side again. So essentially, we need three sources of microdata here. We have the data that underlies the Swedish producer price index. This is on the monthly frequency. Um, we have data also on the monthly frequency for the Swedish industrial production index. And we have annual information on balance sheet items. So we, we know a few things about, uh, about these firms from the Swedish uh, credit bureau. Let me come first to the product, um, to the producer price index. And so the unit of observation is the product level, right? So we have prices for a given product um, that is sold by a particular firm. And we have that for a relatively narrow, uh, narrowly defined product code. Um, for the for the entire Swedish economy. Second source of information is data on industrial production, on this industrial production data set. Why do we need that? Well, because we want to construct for each firm a measure that gives us the exposure of this firm's two global supply chains. And as this exposure measure or, or treatment, if you want, we use the firm-specific export intensity. So that's the ratio between exports to total sales, sales abroad over total sales. And finally, we look at this annual information uh, that gives us information on firm characteristics. And um, we merge all of that together, and this gives us around 200,000 individual price observations for 2,000, roughly 2,000 unique firms in Sweden. Sweden is, of course, the, the prototypical small open economy. so. Um, I think that is a, a, an, an interesting data set. All right, this is, um, I, I mentioned it um, a moment ago, we need this export intensity as a, as a treatment effect, if you want, as, as a measure of how exposed an individual firm is to global supply chains. This is how the distribution of these export intensities looks like uh, for all firms on the left. And then if you exclude the firms with a zero entry, then you come to the, to the figure on the right. And the, the basic, Takeaway here is that we have quite some variation across firms in this in this export um, intensity measure. Now there is a problem with this export intensity measure, and and I, I will be open here um, because the literature typically uses. Uh, let me jump to this. The, the the literature uses another way to measure the exposure to global supply chains, and this is the the, the variable that you see on the horizontal axis here. The literature typically uses the share of foreign value added in exports as a measure of how exposed the firm is to supply chain disruptions. Now, this is not available on a firm level data for Sweden. Um, instead, we use this share of exports uh, over total output. Now, how good is that approximation? Well, that's what we are going to, to, to try to illustrate here. So on a sectoral level, we can plot this for 40 Swedish industries here that the, there is a reasonably high degree of correlation between uh, between the between the two, which motivates us to to proceed and use this ratio of exports over total sales as a measure of how uh, much the firm relies on global supply chains. All right, let's put the microdata aside for a second. I come back, I come back to that in a moment, and move on to the macro side. As I said, we need a global supply chain shock. Now, where's that coming from? We estimate a VAR model. It's th six variables. We have three of them being absolutely standard. That is just industrial production, um, CPI for Sweden, and import prices. And on top of the three, we put in data on international container trade. We have three of these. We have the number of containers. We have the HARPEX index. This is a measure of how costly it is to ship a container um, uh, across the, the sea. And we have the global supply chain pressure index, which is this aggregate measure that comes from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York that summarizes lots of information among them, like um, the purchasing manager indices and, and so on and so forth. That measures also supply chain pressure. So this is the, the block of two, uh, of, of two elements. And we use that in order to identify a global supply chain shock. How do we do that? Well, we use a mix of sign restrictions, relatively conventional sign restrictions, 
and narrative restrictions, so restrictions based on narrative information. Let me come first to the sign restrictions. Here you see the, three, the, the, the six uh, endogenous variables. We impose three restrictions on the response to our global supply chain shock. Now, the prices for shipping a container should go up. The container throughput, that's another word for, for the, the number of containers that falls. So going, volumes going up and prices going down, going in opposite directions means that is a supply side disruption. And on top, we, we impose uh, this restriction that the global supply chain pressure goes up. That's the, the three set of sign restrictions. Important to notice that we don't impose any restriction, excuse me, we don't impose any restriction on the three macro data here. Now, on top of that, we impose narrative information, restrictions from narrative information. And the purpose of this narrative information is to make sure that the global supply chain shock that we eventually going to see is in line with the history, with the established historical narrative. So we impose restrictions on specific episodes. I'm showing you the episodes in a moment. And we select these episodes, not because we believe these are the, mo the, the largest global supply chain shocks necessarily, but they should be the clearest cases of exogenous global supply chain disruptions. So don't be surprised if you later on see, see periods in which the shock is even larger. Um, that is possibly true, but these should be clear cases of global supply chain disruptions. Now, I, I show you these in, 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 in pictures. So um, this is the first, the first episode. So we, we imposed a restriction uh, on March 2011. You remember the, uh, the Tohoku earthquake uh, off the, the, the Japanese East Coast that was, um, that, that was causing a huge damage, not just uh, in, in, in Japan, but had spillover effects on manufacturing industries in, in, in the rest of the world. So we impose the restriction that this shock is positive in this month, where positive means restrictive. I think that is a relatively innocuous uh, assumption. Second assumption, we impose the restriction that the global supply chain shock is positive in March 2021. You remember this episode here, uh, when this uh, container ship was blocking the, the Suez Canal for about a week, um, and we have ships with cargo worth several billion uh, dollars waiting on either side of the, of the, of the channel to, uh, to, to proceed. So we, we impose that the, the shock is positive in this month as well. And finally, we impose um, a restriction that the shock is positive in April 2022. This is when Chinese authorities were fighting uh, the pandemic at all costs and were essentially closing the port of Shanghai for, uh, for days, if, if not weeks. Um, and here we also impose that the shock is not just positive, but it's also the largest shock I'm sorry, I, I have to correct myself. Here we impose, sorry, here we impose that the shock is not just positive, but also the largest shock in this given month among all possible shocks in our system. So let me summarize here. Um, you, you, you see the summary of, of these four restrictions. Um, in the three events, the shock is positive. And on top, we say that uh, in the month of the Tohoku earthquake, this is the largest shock that you can think of in this system of six endogenous, uh, endogenous variables. All right, and that is the uh, the effect on on the aggregate on the aggregate uh, level of of, uh, of of this shock. Well, the variables at the bottom are not so interesting because they we have post restrictions on them, sign restrictions. We have not imposed restrictions on the upper line of responses here. Um, and you see that um, the, uh, the, the blue response that, uh, sorry, the, the red response that the response if you just rely on the conventional sign restrictions. Um, and the blue res response is if you on top impose the narrative information. And what you see is that, for example, the import price response and the consumer price response only become significant if you impose on top of the conventional sign restrictions also this information from the three 
episodes which I just mentioned. So it's this narrative information that makes this, this shock um, um, statistically significant. And that is the shock that eventually comes out of this. Um, I have highlighted here the three episodes on which we impose restrictions, but you also see there have been other episodes in which you see potentially even larger shocks. All right. Now I, let's put the macro part aside again and return to the micro site. Remember that we have these um, observations at the individual product level. And what we are going to do here, we estimate standard local projections. So on the left hand side, we, we, we put um, the change in the, the log price of uh, the price of product I and product group J set by firm F in month T. Right? Um, that's on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we have fixed effects for firms, we have fixed effects for months. Um, and we have our shock epsilon. That's the global supply chain shock that we put into these, into these local projections. And you also see here that we are going to inter let the shock and epsilon interact with this exposure measure that I've talked about earlier, right? The, the ratio of firm, ex of, of firm exports over, over total sales. And the object we are interested in is, is this beta coefficient because that tells us uh, whether firms which are particularly exposed to, to supply chains um, set a higher price relative to, uh, to other firms. And then we have, of course, a bunch of, uh, of control variables um, that reflect the business cycle in, um, in Sweden. Um, okay, here's the, um, if you want the baseline finding in, a, in, a, in, the, in a, the linear model here, we see that, well, after a supply chain shock of one standard deviation, producer prices do indeed increase, um, and they increase significantly and relatively persistently uh, over, uh, over roughly two years. That's on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we essentially reproduce the producer price index. We, we weight the, the different products um, and use the weights from the Swedish producer price. Um, so we rebuild the producer price index from from the uh, from the individual price observations, and the the response is very similar to this uh, to this unweighted um, response. So that's the the overall uh, picture. Firms raise prices significantly after the, um, the the global supply chain disruption. Um, well, this is relatively robust. We can include fixed uh, effects for uh, time fixed effects. Uh, we also tried to, to use a, um, a reduced form shock um, um, where we just put the, the, where we ignore the, the, the VAR with sign restrictions and narrative information and just use uh, for robustness purposes, just use the, the change in the global supply chain uh, pressure uh, index and uh, you see roughly similar, um, similar results. All right. Now let me turn to the Final part where we look at the heterogeneity across firms. So the, the, the panel local projection is, is, is the baseline and we extend that and allow for different um, types of firms. So this is firm type A and this is firm type B. Each firm belongs to one of these two, uh, two types and we estimate a regression for each of them. And this is this indicator variable tells us whether the firm is here or there, right? It's a standard um, interacted panel local projections or state dependent local projections where the state are firm properties. Right? And that gives us two uh, beta coefficients. We call one state H like high and the other one L like low. Um, Two different beta coefficients, and of course we are interested in how different and, and how yeah, how different are these beta coefficients if we separate between firms, and we we use um, a couple of variables to distinguish use a couple of variables to distinguish um, between firms. Right? Remember that we have this uh, th this information from firms balance sheets, um, for example. Um, and from the industrial production uh, data set, so we can distinguish between small versus large firms, right, based on 
the sales, we can distinguish between firms with a, a very strongly export oriented and just uh, have a, a small export intensity. Uh, we can look at products being exported or sold at home. We can look at inventories, which is, I think, particularly interesting given that um, in, in light with the shortages of, of, of materials that we have seen uh, arising as a problem over the past couple of, of years. Uh, we distinguish between different firms that sell multi-product multi versus single products. Um, and eventually we looked at high versus low unit labor costs. The idea is that a firm that uses most of its resources to pay the wage bill um, might respond differently to a firm that um, has just a tiny share of resources going for wages and pays and needs more resources to pay for raw materials and, and imported goods, for example. Now, it's important to, to stress that um, over our sample period, a firm is not just fixed in one state or the other state. So a firm can, can in one year be in the, uh, can, can count as a high firm or as a low firm in the next year, right? So we don't require that the firm stays um, in one group or the other for the full sample period. And typically we split um, between firms at the median. So 50% of the firms are counted as small, the other half of firms are counted as large and we do it similarly for the um, for the other variables that you see here um, now you could ask um, before i show you the the um, the impulse response functions well how different are all these properties do we measure always the same for, uh, is it always the same firm that is large has high export intensity uh, many products are being sold and so on and so forth. So how large is the overlap between the two, uh, between the indicators? And we, uh, we, we present this in this way. So um, here we see the percentage overlap between these firm indicators. Um, so a firm that has a high export intensity um, uh, of these firms, then 39% have a high inventory ratio, for example. Right? So you see, there's 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 an overlap certainly um but i think this overlap is not so large that it would not allow us to distinguish to, to look at these indicators separately all right now here are a few results and then i'll show you um another set of, of impulse response functions and um i hope they are not too, too small um so here you see size um and um in blue, you see large firms, and in green, you see small firms. And it seems to be that, well, both raise prices, but the large firms have more price setting power than the small firms. So prices increase significantly for the large firms, but not significantly small for the small firms, right? So there seems to be heterogeneity in the sense uh, that large and small firms respond differently. Here we have in the export intensity, so firms which are heavily export uh, intensive, they set a higher price compared to firms which are less export intensive. There's not so much of a difference between goods being sold abroad and at home. Um, there's this, this difference between inventory holdings. So it, it seems to be, uh, which is in line with our prior, that firms that have a low, that are in the bottom half of inventory holdings, right, firms that have below the median levels of inventories, they set a higher price. Right? That's the green line, that's above the blue line where inventory holding is, is high. That's in line with our intuition. Um, unfortunately, it's, it does not really seem to be so different from each other, right? The, the, the confidence bands overlap um, quite a bit, um, but at least the sign of the, of the response is, is uh, in line with the expectation. Um, then I distinguish here between single and multi-product firms. Um, so, so, firm, so firms that have sell multi-products, many products, set a higher price compared to single product firms. Firms with many product groups set a higher price compared to firms with just a, a single product. 
And finally, I want to talk about unit labor costs. So the idea here, why we include unit labor costs is that, well, if a firm is very labor intensive, um, then it might not care so much about raw materials being delayed or bottlenecks in, in supply chains, um, while a firm that has just a, a small share of unit labor costs um, uh, might care more about, about these types of things. And we see indeed that high unit labor cost firms, they don't respond to this, um, to, to this support, supply, global supply chain uh, disruption. While firms with um, high unit, with low unit labor costs, they set a significantly higher price following this um, this global supply chain disruption. Now, let me summarize here what we do. We combine this macro and micro perspective. Essentially, we look at the the macro side, and from the macro model, from the VAR model, we we take this identified global supply chain shock. Then we, we feed it into the, into the micro data um, and look at firm heterogeneity. heterogeneity. We, we see that firms significantly increase prices following the global supply chain shock, and that there is quite a, a degree of heterogeneity um, across firms. I have more pages, more slides here in, in, the, um, in the backup, but um, I leave it here. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, uh, Peter. The discussant is Tim Schmitz Eisenlor. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. This, uh, this is a great conference. Um, so I really enjoyed reading this paper, and um, I hope you find the comments helpful. Um, because I'm at the board and I was actually told because this is video, I actually have to read this whole thing. So the views expressed in this presentations are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect <clears throat> the position of the Federal Reserve Board or the Federal Reserve System. So I think it's, we don't really have to motivate this and I'm also gonna skip over a lot of the summary because I think the presentation was really clear. It was very, very easy to follow. So I'll mostly focus on my comments, but obviously this is one of the questions we've all thought a lot about um, in recent time, which is, you know, how do global supply chain shocks affect inflation? How important are they relative to all the other things that have been happening? And, um, and this paper really tries to speak to that literature by doing two things. One of them is, you know, to take macro and time series effects seriously. So they, they really want to get the, these dynamics right. So they do the structural VAR um, with both sign restrictions and narrative approach. And then at the same time, they, they use this really nice uh, Swedish data to, to start going towards the micro level as well and trying to think about how firm heterogeneity may be relevant for a price setting and how these like supply shocks that they identify at the macro level then feed through the micro level. Um, yeah, so I think I can skip over most of this. So the main finding is, well, at the aggregate level, you can see that these uh, supply chain shocks they identify indeed affect producer prices in Sweden with a max increase after about two years. And they do find that um, heterogeneity across uh, quite a few of these um, firm variables. And this is just the pictures you just saw. And I mean, one thing I'm gonna come back to is that um, obviously we've already seen that there's uh, quite a bit of correlation. So if you look at firm size and export intensity, they, these responses look very similar. So, so one of the questions I'm gonna think about more is, you know, how can we tell those things apart a little? Um, so yeah, so I think we, we've seen, so there's basically two parts of the structural VAR. One part is like capturing the Swedish variables, which is like industrial production, consumer price index, import price index. And the second part, which is very specific to, to very precise measures of container shipments, container prices, and this more broad global supply chain pressure index. And then again, there's the, these two sets of restrictions, the sign restrictions, and then these three events um, that uh, Peter went through very carefully. And then they put it into standard um, local projections and they kind of feed the shocks they obtain from this SVAR into, um, into the local projection. So, Obviously, I mean, this crowd understands it's even more than the rest of the world, but this is a very highly relevant topic. And I think there are a lot of intriguing results there. And I have a lot of comments I'll see when Andre kicks me off the stage. But um, my main comments will be thinking more about the mechanism and kind of disentangling those things. And, uh, and then also, I mean, I guess my 
big other comment is like about the SVAR and other global factors and you know how you could extend that to to really I mean to convince us even more that these are like supply shocks and then see it. Okay, so I think what's kind of important is to think about the mechanism and um, it's you tell different things and I think the main mechanism I took away from the paper is something like this. Uh, there's a shipping shock that affects firms because they in, uh, import intermediate inputs and those become costlier or you're like forced to substitute away or whatever. And, and so whatever you do, it's going to increase your cost and thereby increase your prices. And the way they measure it in the empirical setting is they use export intensities. And, you know, that's a proxy they have right now. But let me talk about a few other mechanisms and why, you know, they may want to expand on that. So, so one of them is that if shipping gets um, constrained, there could be other things going on. For example, there's uh, competition by foreign suppliers. And if shipping gets harder, it's not only affecting my intermediate input, it also affects my competition from foreign, uh, foreign other firms in the final goods market. And so that could also increase prices, but it's a different mechanism. And so the question is, do we care about disentangling those two? I think a more uh, like another mechanism that came to my mind that is a little bit more concerning is that if you're constrained in your imports, you're probably also constrained in your exports because probably shipping is constrained in both directions. If I'm less able to sell abroad, well, now it's going to depend a lot on what you assume about production and the timing and so on. But for example, there's a paper by Almunia, Antras, and co-authors that showed in the Spanish case that when Spain had this domestic slump, they started exporting a lot. And their story was, well, you're already producing this, you have this supply. Maybe you have some kind of decrease, uh, increasing returns to scale, so you really want to sell those things. And if that's true, and you're, it's harder to export, maybe you're going to dump more of that into your domestic market, which would actually have the opposite sign, right? And so that's kind of interesting, because now if you were coming to my last point on the slide, if you want to start separating those things, if you were able to get separate measures of export and import intensity, and we know kind of empirically they are highly correlated, but not perfectly so, would actually expect opposite signs. Maybe if that channel is true, then the import intensity would have this increasing effect on your price, but the export intensity may actually have a negative effect. So that would be something really interesting to test. Um, additionally, like the, the other story I was telling, you could look for different measures of competition, you know, like what is the concentration, what is like how much foreign competition is there. And again, like this distinction between competition could also come from separating out final goods versus intermediate goods. And I think in your in one of your other papers, you also looked at upstream and downstream. And so that's another dimension you could look at. So I guess the bigger picture here is um, if we want to go further then um, you know, first we want to understand the transmission, but then we also want to understand what's the optimal policy. And so the optimal policy is going to depend on whether this is driven by imports, by exports, or by competition effects. And so I think that would be really interesting to understand better. Um, we've already seen this table, so I, I think it's pretty clear that um, there is, they're not perfectly correlated, they're pretty highly correlated. And so one thing, I, I haven't run a lot of local projection pedal regressions myself, but I was wondering if there's any way to do a horse race across variables, uh, or if there's like some restriction on the estimation, or there's at least some kind of alternative methods you could use that allow you to do a horse race just to give complementary evidence that, you know, if I, let's say your example, like if you take export intensity and inventory, that's like the smallest one. If you put those at the same time, can you uh, separately identify them? And can you kind of tell, is it si firm size, is it export intensity, and so on. And similarly, uh, the three crises are quite different, and so I would be really interested in running separate event studies and show whether uh, you actually get similar results or different results. I think my other main point is that you have the six variables, but like the few variables that came to my mind that I would have liked to see there, and I was wondering if that's something you could add. For example, there are no global real or financial conditions or global prices in the uh, structural VAR right now. And for example, if you think about the COVID crisis, but also other crises, you would think that these supply shocks could happen at the same time as they're like big macro shocks and big financial shocks. And also, there could be shocks to foreign prices. And if these are traded goods, those could transmit independently of whether transportation becomes more expensive. And so if this is true, then, you know, I know there's some size limits on what you want to put in your SVAR, but I feel like some control for these global shocks and global factors could be useful to 
to really convince us that these are supply shocks. Um, and I understand that the narrative is trying to get there, but I think, I don't know, I think it would be really helpful to have some of these global variables there. Um, yeah, so here I'm just, I don't have time to go through all the details, but I think my main point is you have these three different shocks. And when I look at them, I think they're very different. Like some of them are, I think more about it, like a production shock, like the earthquake, I think has a very severe effect on production. And also the zero COVID policy, um, I think didn't just shut down the, har the harbor, it also affected like production in China. Whereas the Suez Canal is kind of the closest to, I think what that's really close to the story you're telling. So I was just wondering, coming back to my previous point, if you separate those crises out, would you see different effects depending on whether the crisis was more production crisis or more a uh, pure shipping crisis? Um, yeah, so let me see what else I have. Yeah, so I, I think those were my main points. And now um, I'm, I only have one minute, so I'm gonna do only two like of my smaller points. So one of them is, I think it's a, you're doing the sign restrictions and narrative approach. It's really hard to say how important these different parts of the identification are. In particular, um, like how much is added value of the narrative approach in terms of figuring out what's going on here? And it would be helpful to discuss it a little bit. The other one is um, when you feed the local, uh, when you feed the the recovered supply shocks into your local protection, uh, local projection. Um, of course, you have like an estimated right hand side variable, and I was wondering what that, does that do to your standard errors, because at some point in your paper, you make a statement that the standard errors are smaller than in the reduced form, and I was just wondering whether you kind of need to recalculate them a little bit to, to account for the, the estimated um, right hand side variable here. And um, yeah, so I'm going to stop here. I have like two more slides, but I was expecting not to talk about them, but I put them there so we can talk over coffee. Um, so overall, it was a really interesting paper. I think it's it's still um, in early stage. So I think hopefully you can uh, take some of my comments into account and I look forward to the next draft. Great. Um, let's move on to the second presentation, which is by Francesco Gigoli. Okay, it's a tough spot to be before the, the lunch and the panel, but I'll try my best uh, to, to hold you here until the moment. So this is a joint work with Elias Albagli, uh, who's at the Central Bank of Chile, and Emiliano Lutini, who used to be at the Central Bank of Chile, and now is at the World Bank, so usual disclaimer applies for the three institutions. So what we're trying to do in this work is to understand how firms form inflation expectations. And we're gonna leverage some uh, unique micro data to do that. Uh, this is an audience that well known that monetary policy is targeting macroeconomic aggregates, which in turn depend on what firms think about inflation. And uh, firms need to think what inflation will be in order to take production and hiring decisions. And uh, despite we know from the literature that there are extensive sources of information rigidity and information frictions, we really don't know what factors firms take into account at the moment in which they need to forecast aggregate inflation. And uh, so far, the body of the literature that looks at um, different aspects of information frictions relies mostly on professional forecasters and in households. But these, the little evidence we have on firms, suggests that actually these are very different animals and that firms tend to be a little bit more rational and therefore are poor substitutes for um, uh, firm level uh, uh, or firm surveys. Um, so another important point is that firms are really the actor that we care about with, because these are the price setters in the economy. And, uh, and as pointed out by Bernanke in his famous speech in 2007, uh, we know little about what, what these firms, how these firms think about inflation. And uh, one key reason is simply because these data are typically confidential and they're held by country authorities. So what we are going to do here is that we hypothesize that actually firms suffer to some extent from the same issues of information frictions. And in order to solve these issues, they actually draw information along the supply chain. So basically they extract some sort of um, local signal from the prices at which they settle the transaction with their suppliers and they assign some aggregate value. They infer what inflation will be just by looking what is going on in their supply chain. So in this paper specifically, we look at the role of the supply chain in how they affect 
the uh, formation process of inflation expectations on the side of the firms. And uh, we argue that if you want, you can think of this in terms of the Lucas Island model, that basically firms end up using what uh, they observe in their supply chain. So basically they look at the prices at which they settle their transactions. And based on that price, those price changes, they think that inflation will move along the same way. And then we are gonna draw some implications in terms of what this implies in terms of adjustment uh, of uh, inflation expectation to past inflation and the relationship with the full information rational expectation benchmark. So a little description of the data um, and uh, the empirical setting, which is Chile from 2015 and tw until 2021. So in terms of the data, we're gonna draw, uh, first of all, on the expectation survey, which is run monthly by the Central Bank of Chile since 2004. Um, this covers firms in the manufacturing and the retail sector. And specifically, we are going to use one question of this survey, which elicits inflation expectations one year ahead. There are two aspects of this survey which are great. The first one is that the, the survey is run monthly, and we, I will come back to that later in the specification because it helps with the identification of the changes <coughs> in, in inflation, the relationship with inflation expectations. And the second aspect, is that the, the, the survey question is quantitative, which it's, um, uh, it's, it's not so common in firm level uh, uh, survey. And I would say another nice aspect of it is that it elicits inflation expectations at an horizon over which monetary policy is supposed to have some effect and is not too short, which is typically the case in uh, firm uh, level survey. And then we're gonna merge this data set with the VAT transaction data. And uh, here we have basically all these, for the universe of uh, manufacturing and retail firms in Chile, all the business to business transactions since 2014. So the, the sample goes from 2014 up to 21. And uh, um, we basically leverage a regulation that was introduced in Chile in 2014, for which um, electronic invoicing was imposed. So basically through this electronic invoicing, we have all the information about the products that are bought and sold uh, by the firms and the price at which they, they buy and sell. We use the same type of information from the custom registries. So we have also information for the products that are imported and exported. And then we add some other type of information like the uh, monthly revenues, the assets of the firms and the wage bill. Now, why I think that Chile is a great setting is that uh, the few studies that are covering inflation expectations using firms are typically uh, on advanced economies. And uh, um, advanced economies until the most recent years had experienced relative low and stable inflation, which adds a great deal of inattention to macroeconomic development. And here, Chile, despite is one of the most stable emerging markets, still had relatively significant fluctuation in aggregate inflation. It moved from one to five over the sample period. So relatively, in relative terms to advanced economies, you would think that this is a country in which firms have a lower degree of inattention. So I'm gonna just show you a few facts about uh, what we see in the data. On the left-hand side, you have uh, inflation expectations of the firms. You have the interquartile range and the inter range along with the median and the CPI inflation. And what you see is that there is some disagreement across uh, firms about what they think next year inflation will be. Uh, the range, the inter range moves between 0 0.5 and 2 percentage points, depending on whether inflation is. If you actually see, whenever the inflation approaches the inflation target of 3% set by the Bank of Chile, you see that actually this, uh, this, this margin uh, squeezes and then it gets wider whenever you get out of uh, or away from the target. But overall, there seems to be some correlation uh, with, the, with the, the inflation outcome, as you can see from the right hand side chart. So if you want to take away from this chart is that, yes, there is some disagreement across firms. And we are going to move to another chart here, just purely descriptive. Um, in which we basically show the share of firm month observations uh, which respond to changes in CPI inflation. So basically, said another way, we take the change in inflation expectation, sorry, the change in actual inflation, the release of actual inflation, 
And we see how firms change their inflation expectations right after the release of that. And you see that basically the gray bar suggests that almost half of the countries do not really change their inflation expectations. And we are selecting episodes in which inflation changed by a relatively significant amount. We are taking one standard deviation just to avoid mild fluctuations. So these are responses to a relatively large, I would say, non-mild changes in, in actual inflation. You see that almost half do not react, which suggests that despite uh, we are in an emerging economy with relatively significant inflation fluctuations. There is still a large proportion of firms that do not adjust their inflation expectations. And about a fifth of, uh, of, uh, of the observation suggests that actually firms think that inflation will decrease whenever past inflation increased and vice versa. So obviously this can be a reflection of what firms think about monetary policy will be. Uh, but still, there's some uh, um, interesting stuff ongoing here. And on the right-hand side, I'm doing the same, but instead of taking changes in actual inflation, I'm taking changes in the GDP. So basically, you see that you have the same sort of pattern, a large proportion of firms not changing their inflation expectations. And again, I mean, when inflation, when GDP growth goes up by a significant amount, firms think that inflation will go down and vice versa. So if you want, you can think of this as firms having some, some sort of supply side view of inflation. They associate these uh, shocks or they attribute these shocks to being supply driven. And uh, so how does the supply chain matter in all this? So if you want, again, you can think about uh, a setting such as the Lucas one in which you have all firms located on different islands and they learn only from the islands they trade with. And uh, so they face a signal extraction problem. They need, to they, need, they need to forecast inflation in order to think about their production decisions and hiring decisions, but they only use the information that they can get by trading with these uh, different islands. So if you think in these terms, then you can also think that this agreement may arise just because firms but they, they basically trade with uh, different suppliers in different sectors, so they observe different prices. And if that, uh, um, if that happens, basically if thing, the firms will think about different values for inflation. And this, uh, while this is logical, uh, it's also consequential if you think that eventually these expectations translate in price setting, because they would lead to price dispersion and in effect, uh, inefficient pricing. Um, you can also then rationalize inattention relatively easily because if uh, firms only care about what is going on in their surroundings because this is what is relevant to their business, they are not really attentive to the macroeconomic developments, developments in the country. So what I'm showing here on the left-hand side is basically a distribution of our microdata. You have input price inflation, which is just a weighted average of uh, uh, the prices that firms pay uh, when, they, when they transact with their suppliers. And you can see that distribution is very wide, um, which is not, again, it's not surprising. You have firms that are buying from different suppliers, different products in different sectors. But again, remember, it's consequential if this is matters for how they think about inflation and inflation, and that passed through to, to price setting. Um, another key fact about this chart is that you have a longer right tail. So deviations from the median are larger on the, on the right hand side. Um, it's not really visible here because CPI inflation is plotted on the right hand side, on the right side, or right axis, sorry. But basically the, the standard deviation of input price inflation is about 20 times uh, the one of uh, CPI inflation. And despite all these features in the data, there is mild positive correlation with uh, um, between input price inflation and uh, CPI inflation expectation, uh, sorry, CPI inflation. So I'm going to analyze this right-hand side chart in a little bit more systematic way. I'm going to estimate, similar to the previous paper, some local projections. I have done on the left-hand side uh, cumulative changes in inflation expectations. and. Uh, uh, on the right hand side, I think that's, that's uh, the important part here because we have both input price inflation with varies at the firm level. So it's the, basically the variable associated with the coefficient gamma. And then you have 
aggregate observed inflation, which is uh, uh, the, the variable associated with coefficient beta. So basically, we are really isolating movements in input price inflation that are not related to uh, how CPI inflation will evolve. So if you want, this is a clean test for the full information rational expectation framework, because if, you, if you're thinking these terms, any, any idiosyncratic movements in inflation that is not uh, any predictive power for CPI inflation should be ruled out. And uh, instead, if we find that actually gamma coefficient is different from zero, that would be a violation of the fire frame. Few aspects that I think are, are relevant here is that in the majority, for the majority of the firms, input price input prices are exogenously determined. Uh, obviously, there are cases in which firms have some monopsony power, and therefore they are able to impose prices on their suppliers. In uh, in a set of uh, additional results, we remove those firms that have suppliers that, on average, have less than 25 buyers. So in a way, we are trying to track those firms that have some sort of monopsony power, and we are removing those. Um, another nice thing, um, there is a paper in the, literature, in the literature that estimates a similar specification using uh, sectoral prices. And I think that uh, our measure of input price inflation, which varies at the firm level, has this uh, advantage of really um, being a good measure of what, what prices firms observe. Um, and um, again, similar things to what I said before, expectations are elicited at one year horizon. And again, here we have monthly frequencies. So basically, uh, the, the, the possibility that there are confounding factors between the moment in which firms observe last month inflation and the moment in which they need to submit to the survey is uh, significantly reduced compared to quarterly um, uh, frequency surveys. So on the left hand side here, you have the main results. So this is the reaction of uh, inflation expectations to a one standard deviation increase in input price inflation. Again, remember, this is, these are movements in input price inflation that are not related to aggregate inflation. So really, these have no predictive power for aggregate inflation. And to some extent, we thought that these results are remarkable because these are, these are movements that uh, firms observe on their supply chain that have nothing to do with the, the aggregate dynamics of inflation. And you see that the effect is statistically significant and it dies out over a 14 months. And the reason it, it dies out, I mean, we speculate that it could be probably that firms realize that these prices that they've seen along the supply chain actually have no impact on aggregate inflation and eventually they adjust. Uh, on the right hand side, you have just the reaction of uh, input, sorry, of inflation expectations to a shock in CPI inflation. And over there, not much of a surprise. Basically, there is some persistence and uh, firms adjust inflation expectations consistently, even though the effect is uh, short lived and possibly because they expect that the central bank will uh, intervene and adjust uh, uh, rates over the monetary policy horizon, you won't see an effect. Um, here we just add to the specification industry price indexes, also to relate a little bit to the closest paper we have in, in, in the literature, but we really want to see whether we are still capturing idiosyncratic movements in, in uh, input price inflation. And the results, on the left you have the, 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 uh, the movement in input, the response of uh, inflation expectations to a one standard deviation increase in industry inflation, on the right hand side, we have our baseline results, but controlling for uh, industry level inflation. And what you see is that basically they are very similar. In, if anything, they're a little bit larger. Again, not, uh, uh, I think the advantage here is that really we are isolating those movements that are idiosyncratic and they're not related to CPI inflation. One clear concern about the specification that we have estimated is that uh, by construction, we are controlling for CPI inflation at time t. So we are imposing some sort of contemporaneous orthogonality between input price inflation and uh, um, CPI inflation. So in a way, it hinges on this contemporaneous orthogonality. However, in a set of uh, uh, other results, we allow for, well, we, we come up with a way to 
to basically impose future orthogonality. We run a set of firm by firm regressions in which we want to assess the, the predictability of input price inflation for aggregate inflation. And uh, uh, whenever we find that coefficient gamma to be uh, not significant, it means non-predictability. And we want those firms for which this is non-predictable because it would entail, it would mean that uh, it's a clear violation of the FIRE framework. And uh, then we compute the share of firms for which this input price inflation is known as no predictive power for uh, CPI inflation contemporaneously and in the future. And then we re-estimate our baseline specification by excluding those firms that for which actually there is some predictability. So the results, you have about 80% of the firms for which actually input price inflation does not predict uh, aggregate inflation. We remove the 20% for which actually there is some predictability, and we find roughly the, the same results, uh, meaning that an increase in input price inflation leads to a temporary increase in uh, um, inflation expectations. Another key concern is that we have some sort of results that depend on the empirical methodology we are using. They are an artifact of the empirical methodology. So one way to get around this is to create a placebo series of input price inflation. And the way we approach this is that for each firm, in our sample for each firm I, we consider all other firms and regress all, uh, one by one all the other firms supply chain inflation on firms I uh, supply chain inflation. And then we isolate or we take only uh, the um, series that produces the smallest B coefficient. And then we basically stack this series all together. We rerun our panel specification with this placebo series. And what I'm showing you here is the response of input, oh, sorry, of inflation expectations to a change in this placebo series. And good news is not statistically significant, which tells us that basically the results do not depend or are not an artifact of the uh, empirical methodology. So in uh, the last couple of slides of the presentation, I'm going to focus on some heterogeneity. I know this is an easy catch. I mean, we, we, when you have firm level data, you want to study heterogeneity, but do remember that here we have about 350 firms. So it's a relatively small sample. Those are the firms that answer uh, the, the uh, expectation survey. And the first thing we want to do is to basically draw on the literature at the household level, which tells us that there is some perceptual learning, basically that households, for households, it matter much more how frequently they buy goods rather than the amount they spend on them. So basically, we want to construct a measure of input price inflation that overweights goods that firms buy more frequently. And uh, another, another implication of this perceptual learning is that if you have infrequent shoppers that shop more uh, at distant points in time, they should observe larger price increases between these uh, trips. And we wonder if that, I mean, the literature at least finds that that is relevant for how households form their inflation expectations. We want to be sure that this is the case or not for, uh, for the firms. So in the results I, I show you here in the tables, I'm focusing only on horizon four to six, just because this is the moment in which we have the peak effects in our baseline. And what you see is that this frequency adjusted measure of input price inflation does not really matter. So to some extent firms, maybe you can interpret these are relatively more rational in a way. They rule out how frequently they buy the product, but for them what matters is like uh, how large is the expense on these goods. So our measure of uh, uh, value-weighted measure of input price inflation turns out to be statistically significant even when we control for the frequency adjusted measure. And then another clear uh, aspect of the heterogeneity is whether these effects are asymmetric and whether they depend on the size of the shock. So the first thing we see over here is that uh, positive changes in input price inflation matter and deflation on the supply chain does not. So in a way, you have some sort of analog to uh, downward price rigidity. Also, inflation expectations seems to be rigid to the downward. And uh, um, another aspect is that if you, if you see these results in terms of the rational inattention framework, firms should not react differently uh, to prices that have, to price shocks that have different magnitudes. 
if you think about this perception learning and silence argument, you should see stronger effects for large changes in prices. And uh, we do not find evidence actually for, uh, for salience. So if anything, the results are more consistent with the uh, rational and attention framework. So I'm going just to summarize the main conclusions of uh, the paper. We have shown that uh, firms have significantly different views about next year inflation and that they pay little attention to macro developments in line what, with basically what happens in other countries, despite Chile is relatively uh, more and uh, seen larger fluctuations in aggregate inflation. We shown or we, we, we estimated that uh, firms rely on observed price changes in order to predict inflation at the aggregate level, even if these changes are unrelated to, to uh, inflation. Um, and then we have shown some evidence that these uh, um, inflation expectations adjustment are rigid to the downside and no evidence of perceptual learning or uh, based on the frequency and the size of price adjustments. I think that um, in one extension of this paper, we are trying also to estimate whether these expectation turns or pass through to how firms set prices uh, by estimating a Phillips curve at the firm level. We have several difficulties there because obviously we do not observe the expectation of the firms for their own prices. Uh, so it's, there are other assumptions that need to be made. But in any case, I, uh, we, what we observe is that Inflation expectations matter a lot in these estimates for how firms set prices. So um, clearly one implication of the results is that forecast disagreement can translate into price dispersion, which is a problem or reducing efficiency of pricing. There is some reduced effectiveness of the policy of the expectation channel of policies as firms really what matter for them is what is going on in their, in their surroundings. And uh, um, our findings are consistent with the rational attention idea, which weakens the weight that inflation has in the formation uh, expectation mechanism and uh, uh, can give rise, therefore, to more persistent inflation. And uh, um, also building on a paper that uh, in the GME that just came out, uh, um, improvements in communication that especially both in terms of clarity and the reach of communication towards certain firms, especially the ones that are at the center of uh, the production network, can help limit the effects of these uh, uh, information frictions. Thank you. Great. Uh, the discussion is uh, Nitya Pandra, Lion IR. Uh, great. Thank you, thank you very much for, for having me here to discuss this paper. I really enjoyed reading it, even though I read on vacation, so that says a lot for the paper. Um, so let me begin with sort of classical discussion style, just outlining what paper has done in some context. So what's paper doing? It's, it's studying something that's very intuitive, actually, exposed uh, how supplier prices uh, feed into firms' inflation expectations. So they have many contributions. They have this great data, the, the firm to firm network data, which has supplier prices and firm prices. Uh, Chile just has fantastic data in so many dimensions. It can be linked to uh, many other data sets in particular. Uh, they have this firm inflation expectation survey. Um, and so what they're doing with, this great data, with these great data is uh, first documenting uh, the reason for the wide dispersion in firm inflation expectations. So now there is abundant work, uh, numerous papers by Kuebion Gornichenko and various co-authors that documents that, there, that firm inflation expectations are dispersed. Um, but somewhat surprising to me is that, you know, um, no one had as yet considered that the prices that firms see from their input suppliers might affect uh, this dis or might explain some of this dispersion, right? So this is, this is uh, I think, a very natural question, and so I really like uh, the motivation for this paper. So what do they find? They find that uh, the input prices that firms see um, matter for firm beliefs about uh, 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 aggregates, about inflation. Uh, this is even controlling for CPI, okay, uh, for CPI growth. Uh, and it's very intuitive. So the, on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the, the firms that you trade with and the prices that you face um, are what matter um, uh, for your business and potentially, you know, inform your, your um, uh, beliefs about aggregate inflation. And there is an analog in the consumer side. So the paper that um, Francesco highlighted by uh, Ulrika and her co-authors, 
uh, shows that you know the grocery prices that consumers face when they go shopping affects their beliefs about aggregate inflation. Okay, particularly things that you buy very frequently. So this is this is extremely intuitive, and I, again, I think it's surprising that it wasn't done before. So I think this is really cool that they do this, um, and it has a number of implications, uh, and also you know some other things that the paper paper pointed out. So first, clearly there's a violation of full information rational expectations. Um, here, uh, there's, there's support for the Lucas model. Sorry, I have a typo there. Should be nine seventy two. Um, and then there's, they, they also find that there's some downward rigidity in their beliefs. Okay, so firms tend to uh, in, have um, increased expectations of inflation much more than they're they're willing to reduce them, even if they see uh, lower input prices. And so the inflation declines might be sluggish as a result. Uh, then then there are a number of implications, as he pointed out. Um, in particular, uh, the takeaway I had from the paper, actually, the policy implication was a little bit different, which is that there's a lot of attention on the communication uh, central banks or, or the Fed puts out around its uh, decisions. Um, and that might actually not be as useful if firms are not paying attention to um, aggregate inflation, aggregate inflation expectations. What might matter much more is, um, you know, somehow influencing the, the, their beliefs about input, input price changes or the, the price changes that they see. Okay, so the, the um, overall Fed statement and the, the uh, communi clearer communication about the Fed decisions might not actually be as helpful because firms are not paying attention to, to um, uh, firm beliefs. Uh, there could be other implications too. I think the paper could actually push more on this. This is a, a sort of a, a minor comment. Uh, I think that there would be a lot that we could learn from this um, and they could push more on that. But broadly, I really like the paper. And so as a result, uh, I'm not going to criticize the motivation. I'm not going to criticize the, the question, the findings, and even largely the specifications. This will be a very, very short discussion because I enjoyed reading it. Um, what I'm going to do is um, talk a little bit about the data. Okay? And so here's um, two plots from the paper. The one on the left you saw in the presentation. Uh, the one on the right you did not. Um, so on the left, you see input price inflation. You see, you know, as uh, Francesco pointed out, there's um, very wide dispersion in input price deflation, uh, inflation, and the, the input price changes median can be as high as 22.6%. Okay, so this is, this is very high. And one side deviation is 23.8%. So this is, this is like 45% uh, input price change. Okay? On the left, you see sales price inflation. So this was not in the, in the talk. Um, and you see that sales price inflation actually is um, not as dispersed. It's much narrower. Okay, so the median is as high as 9.5%, and the side deviation is also lower, only 17.5%. Okay, so this is, this is a much, much tighter um, band of price changes. So initially, when I saw this, I said, okay, that makes sense. It's limited pass-through. Um, firms are getting these big uh, input price increases, and then they're not passing it through to, to their consumers. Um, maybe there's some substitution going on. There's, there's, we, we can look at the wage bill and so on. Um, but then I realized that this is firm-to-firm -firm network data, and so there's no clear distinction between an input supplier and a firm that a firm's sales price. Okay, so the same firms are buying and selling in this data. So in a sense, what you would expect is that the graph on the left, um, graph on the left is uh, a weighted average of the graph on the right. On the right. Okay, but that becomes uh, that that almost can, that cannot be. Right? So then something is going on. So it's possibly, I think this was not very clear in the paper, I think what is going on is that the sample of firms here is very different from the sample of firms there. Okay? So that, I think, is what is going on. But regardless, that was a little bit of a puzzle to me. Um, I think, why am I highlighting this? Uh, I think it would be important to understand why some of these input prices, price changes, are so volatile. Okay, what, 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 where are these 45% price changes coming from? Uh, is it because the firm, so when you think about this as a weighted um, average bundle of price changes, uh, to, see such, to see such large price changes, you are going to likely have that uh, there's high exposure of, of the buying firms to firms that, are, uh, that have the most volatile price changes. Uh, that also likely means that the firms with the most volatile price changes are the largest firms in the economy because that's uh, uh, an exposure measure. That's going to drive the exposure measure. Okay, so who are these firms? Why are their price changes so volatile? Is it because they're connected to other volatile firms? Is it because something else is going on? Uh, I think the Chilean data actually has the resources to figure this out. Um, why do we care? Again, as I, as I pointed out, I think 
Uh, that graph suggests that it's the largest firms in Chile that are raising their prices the most, okay, the, who have the most volatile prices. And so that, I think, is something that is important to understand, uh, particularly because, um, you know, these price changes, if they're the, if they're the Walmarts of Chile that are raising their prices so much, uh, they're likely to affect aggregate inflation directly. Okay, so I think uh, you could think, for instance, of the granular origins of inflation. Andrea has some work on this. Uh, it, it might be that these firms are important enough that they are actually affecting inflation. Um, so Francesco talked about, you know, the the control. He did this this test. So the CPI control itself uh, takes out uh, aggregate inflation from the average input price bundle, but it doesn't control directly for these very large firms that might be driving some of the the uh, extreme price changes. Okay, considering future CPI inflation also does not uh, address this, what you'd kind of want to do is uh, try to look at firm by firm whose sales prices are actually affecting or, or correlated at least with aggregate inflation. Okay, so that's something that I think they have the resources to do, they should be doing that. Um, uh, and if that's the case, then, you know, if the firm is not actually considering its uh, weighted average input bundle, when forming its inflation expectations, but rather looking at what is going on with these extreme price changes in its most important supplier, it might actually be rational for the firm to then think that aggregate inflation is going to be high because those price changes will translate into aggregate inflation. Okay, so that um, I think is something that they could do. I know from talking with them that they are working on a little bit more on this pass through, so maybe, you know, this can be something that, they, that they'll be able to figure out. Um, okay, so some final thoughts. I think that you know, the data has these resources and I think it would be really important to understand where this input price volatility is coming from. Is it the largest firms? Why are their prices so volatile? Uh, and there's a possible policy implication, which is you want to do targeted communication towards these firms. If some of what is going on is that these firms are raising their prices because they think uh, inflation is going to be high or, or because they know they're going to affect aggregate inflation, I don't know. There could be something going on there that, that there's a, a role for uh, for, for some policy. Okay, so that, uh, that's my discussion. Again, as I said, it's going to be short because I actually really liked, I enjoyed reading the paper. Uh, I think it, again, um, uh, emphasizes it's really important to understand what is driving agents' beliefs. We have plenty of evidence that uh, full information rational expectation models are not great. Uh, now, we, now we're starting to understand what actually drives agents' expectations about, uh, about aggregates. And I think the, the um, um, the paper is highlighting a very plausible role for supply chains. Okay, so it's very, very plausible that, you know, your, the, the, the trades you make on a day-to-day -day basis are really more important to you than some hypothetical aggregate inflation that is not relevant for your own, uh, for your own business. Um, but it also makes clear to me that, you know, we need more surveys that expand the supply chains. These are all domestic supply chains. There are also global supply chains. I think we, we need more surveys that uh, allow us to understand agents' beliefs in an international context. Okay, so I think that's something that's missing in the literature. Uh, but I'm sure that this, is a, this paper is going to have many uh, applications. Thank you.